You are listening to an After Dinner Conversation magazine podcast. After Dinner Conversation believes humanity is improved by ethics and morals grounded in philosophical truth, and that truth is discovered through intentional reflection and respectful debate. In order to facilitate this process, we have created a growing series of print books, a monthly short story magazine, and two different podcasts. This podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Audiobooks, provides readings of stories that have appeared in our magazine, and we discuss them in our companion podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Discussions. We hope you'll continue the discussion with friends, family, and students, or head over to the comments section on our website or Facebook page. And please subscribe to our podcast, share it on social media, and suggest it to friends. Thank you for supporting us through your magazine subscriptions and through patreon.com. Links are in the description. I'm Tina Forsey, an acquisition editor at After Dinner Conversation. This story is written by Paul Hilding and was published in our 2021 magazine. Taps. I am alone, standing on the crumbling back steps of the old church, my trumpet by my side in my right hand. The church cemetery, dotted with countless rows of neatly arranged headstones, descends gradually towards the slate-gray sea. It is a raw, blustery day in mid-April. The first buds have appeared on the wild roses that have overgrown the cemetery wall, and on the storm-blasted stand of oak trees beyond. A single white sail is visible offshore. The damp salt air carries a faint smell of decay, of seaweed and debris washed up on distant beaches. Far below, a small group of mourners is gathered by an open grave. He and I were about the same age, from neighboring towns but had never met. Still, I knew well the difficult choice he had been forced to make 50 years ago as he graduated high school and began planning his life. It was the same choice I had faced at about the same time. It was the same choice faced by the three others I had played for in the past year, dozens of others over past decades. All of them had chosen to serve, all except me. Someone from VFW called me a few days ago. They know I play for Vietnam vets. This also is my choice. But no matter how many times I play, it seems I can never make up for that other choice I made so long ago. The newspaper story had been respectful, but short. He had been a good student and an athlete, a star-wide receiver in high school. Wounded at Long Bay, bronze star, purple heart. Two weeks ago, a road crew had found him under a bridge, most of his worldly possessions in a rusty shopping cart hidden in the brush nearby. As always, I needed to know more. By now, after so many, I had a set routine. As soon as I received the call from VFW, I Google searched the name. I tracked down family and friends. I learned as much as I could about where and when they had served, battles they had fought, what they had done after the war. But mostly, I tried to figure out why. Why had they chosen to serve? I felt like I had to know before I could play at the service, before I could even attempt to honor the sacrifice, the sacrifice I had avoided making. From my investigations of the others, I had learned that some had believed in the war, but that many thought it was a mistake. They hadn't bought the bullshit about falling dominoes, about fighting for democracy in a godforsaken jungle on the other side of the world. They had gone anyhow, even though there had been other choices. What about this one, the one under the bridge? His name was Daniel. Such a promising life ahead of him. Why had he gone? As I began gathering information about Daniel and reading about the Battle of Long Bay, I soon realized his funeral would not be like the others, as difficult as they had been. For me, Daniel's would be by far the most wrenching. It was not just because of the horrific accounts of the battle I located online. No, there was something else. There was a coincidence a brutal, personal connection. The deeper I dug into Daniel's story, the more excruciating the pain I felt. I doubted I would be able to play at the funeral, but I also realized I could never live with myself if I did not. Long Vey had been a small special forces output deep in the jungle in the far north of South Vietnam. It was one of North Vietnam's first targets during the Tet Offensive, the North's all-out attempt to win the war in early 1968. On February 6, 1968, two dozen Green Berets and a few hundred South Vietnamese and Lao soldiers were directly in the path of three battalions of North Vietnamese infantry and a dozen Soviet-made tanks. The defenders put up a fierce fight, 
taking out five of the 12 tanks. But the base was quickly overrun. And as eight of the surviving Green Berets fell back to the reinforced concrete command bunker, they learned that their repeated request for reinforcements from the Quezon, a large American marine base just six miles away, had been denied. Somehow they managed to hold out in the bunker for 15 hours as the North Vietnamese tried to dislodge them with tear gas, fragmentation grenades, point-blank tank fire, and finally several bricks of C4 in the ventilation system. All but one of the Green Berets were badly injured by gunfire, shrapnel, and the shock waves from the repeated explosions in the enclosed space of the bunker. But under cover of long-delayed American airstrikes, seven of the eight managed to escape. I also found online the cruel footnote to the story. After months of defending Khe Sanh against the North Vietnamese attack, after American planes had dropped more than 100,000 tons of bombs on enemy forces in the area, after thousands of American troops had been killed or wounded, the North Vietnamese assault was finally defeated. However, only two months later, in June of 1968, America's war planners decided that Khe Sanh no longer served America's military strategy, and all troops were withdrawn. Quezon was abandoned. As it happened, February 6, 1968 was also an important day in my own life. On the very day that Daniel and his comrades were trying to escape that firestorm of machine gun fire, artillery rounds, and Russian tanks, I was also planning an escape. I had spent that morning at home packing a suitcase and backpack, and had then jammed them, along with my trumpet case, into the trunk of my first car, a battered old Volkswagen Beetle with bald tires and a cracked windshield. I had already decided that the Vietnam War was both stupid and immoral. My parents and nearly all my friends agreed with me. I had just read cover to cover the newly published Manual for Draft Age Immigrants to Canada. Later that day, I had a final somber dinner with my parents. We went over my options one more time. Yes, the war was wrong, but what was the right thing to do? Serve anyway? Be complicit in senseless killing and possibly lose my own life? Resist, join the anti-war protests, and end up in prison with a criminal record that would last a lifetime? Or escape to Canada and risk never being able to return home? As before, we came to the same conclusion. Canada was only 200 miles away. It was the best of three lousy choices. Dad quietly reviewed with me the procedures for requesting permanent immigration status. Job leads he had managed to get through family friends in Montreal. College classes he would help me pay for, and plans for my return home after the war. I remember the brave smile on my mother's face, her tearful reassurance about how wonderful Canada would be. After a sleepless night and goodbye hugs in the icy driveway the next morning, I started driving north on mostly deserted roads across a gray winter landscape. I did not return home for nine years after the amnesty. I had enough credits from courses in Canada that I was able to quickly finish my music degree and find a job teaching at a nearby high school. After a short, childless marriage, I moved into a one-bedroom apartment near the school and busied myself with my job, conducting both a high school band and chorus and giving voice and instrumental lessons. More than anything, the enthusiasm and joy of my students inspired and sustained me. By diving deep into this work that I loved, I felt like I was mostly succeeding in controlling my dark thoughts about the war. For a time, I even persuaded myself that playing taps at funerals was just a penance, and that eventually, after enough funerals, perhaps I would feel like I had paid my dues. For most of those years, I considered it a blessing that the military draft had ended, and that my students would never be forced to choose between going to war, going to jail, or going to Canada. It was only shortly before I retired that I began to have second thoughts. One day, during a lunchtime rehearsal, the assistant principal stopped by and asked one of the band members, a giggly redhead named Jan, to come with him to the office. We learned later that Jan's father was one of four American servicemen killed in an ambush earlier that week in Africa, in the country of Niger. The main emotion at school seemed to be disbelief, even more than sadness or grief. No one even knew where Niger was, let alone why Americans were fighting a war there. Shortly after, on one of the few evenings when I was not busy preparing for classes or practicing my own instruments, I caught myself questioning everything I thought I believed about the draft. Yes, Jan's father had enlisted. There was no law that had required him to serve, 
But I thought to my own surprise, would it be better if there was a draft? What if every family in America had to sit down at the dinner table, as my parents had with me during the Vietnam War, and really think about whether or not a war in Southeast Asia or in West Africa or on the Arabian Peninsula was necessary to defend the country? Would America find other ways to solve its problems if everyone's child was potential cannon fodder? It was not hard to locate Daniel's younger sister, Anna. She still lived in the neighboring town where she and Daniel had grown up. The number for her landline popped up with a white pages search. She answered on the first ring and sounded pleased to meet with me after I explained I would be playing at his funeral the next day. On the drive to Anna's house, I realized I was approaching the bridge above the area where they had found Daniel's body. I started wondering about Daniel's final days. I decided I needed to stop. The bridge spanned a small creek flowing through a weedy concrete culvert. I left my car in the rear parking lot of an abandoned strip mall and climbed down a muddy slope. Under the bridge, I soon found the scattered remains of a campsite pieces of cardboard, and a torn tarp littered the underbrush. An old folding cot, one leg missing, rested upside down in the weeds. Someone had kicked the blackened stones from a small fire ring down towards the creek. After looking closely in the damp soil, I located the marks where the legs of the cot had rested before the campsite had been disturbed. Close by, I stumbled over a flat rock hidden in the weeds. The rock seemed out of place, and I lifted a corner. Underneath, in a shallow hole, was a black trash bag. I unknotted the bag and found several bottles of prescription medications with Daniel's name. Also in the bag was a headlamp, a few coins, and an old cigarette carton duct-taped shut. When I pulled the tape off the carton, a purple heart slid into my hand, smooth and cold as a headstone. I stood motionless for a long time looking down at the metal, A light rain had begun to fall, the patter of raindrops joining the chorus of rushing water in the creek and the far-off sounds of traffic. But also in that moment, I imagined I heard a quiet voice, as if Daniel's medal was speaking to me about his sacrifice and suffering, about the profound importance of choices. I felt a numbness and a weariness as old doubts, the doubts that had haunted me for fifty years, descended like a dark fog. The final item in the trash bag was a thick, weathered book, so worn and water-stained that I could barely make out its title, The Collected Dialogues of Plato. Many of the pages were dog-eared, with text either underlined in ink or highlighted with a yellow marker. The margins were crammed with handwritten notes, arrows, and other symbols, most unreadable. I was late for my meeting with Anna, but somehow I knew I needed to spend a few minutes with this book before I would be ready to talk to her. There was a leather bookmark still in place near the front, in the Crido dialogue. I opened the book to that page and caught my breath as I read the highlighted text. Look at it in this way. Suppose that while we were preparing to run away from here, or however you would describe it, the laws and constitution of Athens were to come and confront us and ask this question. Now, Socrates, what are you proposing to do? Can you deny that by this act which you are contemplating, you intend so far as you have the power to destroy us, the laws, and the whole state as well? Do you imagine that a nation can continue to exist and not be turned upside down if the legal judgments which are pronounced in it have no force and are nullified and destroyed by private persons? Once again, I stood motionless for a long moment. Another of Daniel's prized possessions seemed to be speaking to me. Finally, I managed to flip back a few pages to the short introduction, which explained that the Crito dialogue dealt with the aftermath of the trial of Socrates after an Athenian jury had unjustly sentenced him to death. As the dialogue begins, Socrates is in jail awaiting execution. His friend Crito had been allowed to visit and is urging Socrates to let Crito bribe the jailer so Socrates can escape to another country. Even after 25 centuries, the scorn in Socrates' response was unmistakable. Run away from here, or however you would describe it. Socrates had flatly rejected his Canada option. 
Having failed to persuade his fellow citizens of the error of their judgment, he chose to remain in jail, awaiting execution, rather than flee his beloved Athens. As with my own countrymen who had chosen to serve, I needed to understand why. I spent another half hour reading the full dialogue before putting the book, along with the rest of Daniel's possessions, back in the bag and climbing up the embankment to my car. Anna lived in a small white bungalow on a quiet side street, just a few miles from the bridge. The yard and house were neatly kept. The rain shower had stopped, and sunlight was slanting through the clouds, reflecting off the still wet sidewalk and porch and lighting up the red geraniums in her front window boxes. I parked the car and, with an old napkin I found under the seat, tried to wipe the mud off the plastic bag. As I got out of the car with the bag, I saw Anna waiting at the open front door. I'm so sorry I'm late, I said as I hurried up the sidewalk, still brushing at the bag with the napkin. I'm John. This belongs to Daniel. I just found it under the bridge, she said quietly. I, I have been trying to talk myself into going there. She was tall and thin with dark, distracted eyes framed by bookish glasses and short, graying hair. She appeared to be in her early 60s, perhaps 10 years younger than her brother. We used to play there when we were kids. We made forts, and she looked away suddenly, blinking her eyes. I didn't even know he was back in town until they told me they had found him. No need to go. It's very muddy from the rain, I said. I think I found everything. This was hidden in the brush. I handed her the bag. Thank you so much. Please, please come in. Would you like some coffee? I nodded and peeled off my shoes at the door, following her into the house. She gestured for me to sit in one of the two wicker chairs facing each other in a small, sunlit living room. There was a pot of coffee and some mugs on a low glass table between the chairs. Anna placed the bag on the table and began untying the knot, heedless of the dried mud flaking off the bag. Thank you so much for agreeing to play at his funeral, she said, looking down at the bag. There really aren't that many people that will be there, but it will mean so much to those of us who can make it. He lost touch with his friends, everyone, actually, especially after he went off his meds. You know, he was okay for a couple of years after he came back. He went to college, and later he was selling real estate in Chicago, but then he had some kind of a breakdown. I nodded. I'm so sorry. I hope this isn't too painful, but I wanted to know more about Daniel for the service. It helps me. He was a musician also, Anna said, a thin smile on her lips. He played guitar and he sang. He had such a sweet voice. The bag was now open, and she carefully examined the bottles of medication before putting them down on the table. Next, she pulled out the cigarette carton. The purple heart fell onto the floor, and she quickly reached down to pick it up. There was a long silence as she turned it over in her hand. Finally, she placed the medal on the table as well and pulled the Play-Doh book from the bag. I think this was one of his textbooks, she said slowly as she looked it over. College was so hard for him. He started when he got back just a few weeks after the massacre at Milai. The students were protesting. They carried signs that said baby killers. He never fit in. It must have been very difficult for him, I said. What was he studying? He was a philosophy major. Even after all these years, I remember a long talk one evening while he was still in college. He seemed so excited, so hopeful. It's the last time I remember him like that. He mentioned a professor, a retired Marine who was helping him in one of the courses, a Plato seminar, she said, pointing to the book. He said that with the help of his professor, he was figuring some things out, that there were so many surprising parallels, even across thousands of years. I leaned forward. Do you know what he meant by that? She paused, as if considering whether to continue. He told me he felt a very strong connection with Socrates. It was almost weird. She looked down at the metal. He talked like they had been friends, as if they had spent time together. Socrates had also served in the army and survived a war. Socrates was also a social outcast, and most important for Daniel, Socrates had also loved his country, or perhaps the ideal of his country. She reached over to fill my coffee cup and then filled her own, holding it in her lap. I remember he also said that, at its height, Athens, like America, was the world's greatest democracy and the most arrogant, embroiled in endless wars. So he was not in favor of the Vietnam War, I asked, hoping the tone of my voice sounded neutral. 
Well, he did decide to enlist, she said, the thin smile returning briefly. Our father had fought in World War II, and I think he wanted Dad to be proud of him. But Dan definitely had his doubts about Vietnam, even then. She paused, then looked directly at me. What about you? What did you do? I, I went to Canada, I said. I felt my face reddening. There was an awkward silence. I shifted in my chair. I studied music. I see, said Anna. After another pause, she jumped up suddenly. Hey, let me show you a picture of Daniel. This one is from before the war. It was Daniel's prom picture. He looked pretty much like I had imagined. Tall, athletic. He had soft brown eyes and a big goofy grin on his face. Dressed in a black tuxedo, he had his arm around a smiling blonde girl with the light blue gown that matched her eyes. Her name was Carolyn, Daniel's first girlfriend. I was seven. I thought she was so beautiful. Anna continued talking about the prom, about their upbringing, about their father's expectations, but I wasn't really listening anymore. Instead, I was again wondering about Daniel. Did he also have a lifelong debate with himself about the war? Like Socrates, he had confronted the laws and constitution of the country he loved and had chosen to obey. After reading the Crito, had he found any solace? Anna seemed to sense that I was distracted, and she thanked me again as we said overly hasty goodbyes. It was late afternoon, and I headed to the old church to practice the trumpet, another routine I had gotten into long ago. I needed to prepare for tomorrow. But also, over the years, I discovered it worked even better than alcohol to calm me, to quiet inner voices. More than ever, I needed my music fix today. By the time I arrived, a storm had kicked up and a cold, heavy rain was falling. I hurried to the side door. The church was not much to look at. The steeple had blown off in another storm many years before and was never replaced by the frugal New England congregation. So all that was left above the sanctuary was a stub for the bell tower. The sagging sanctuary itself was more than 200 years old, and the peeling white paint on its weathered wood siding was badly in need of care. Someone had recently painted the enormous front doors in almost neon orange, perhaps a vain attempt to attract attention and new members. I heard the rumble of a pipe organ above the shrill wind, even before I stepped inside. The sanctuary was dark, the only light coming from the long row of tall, thin, stained-glass windows that ran the length of the building on both sides. It smelled of old wood, dusty hymnals and candle wax, of generations of Christmas Eves and baptisms and funerals. In the dim light behind a simple altar, I could make out the massive gleaming pipes of the organ, the gold ornamentation on the supporting struts, the rich wood finish of the keyboard frame and backing panels. The rest of the sanctuary was unadorned. The pews were bare pine benches. The tile floor was cracked and stained with age. The organist, a slight man in his forties with silver-rimmed glasses, was pounding out a Bach fugue filling the sanctuary with a rich, resonant wall of sound, the bass so powerful it shook the floor and seemed to press on my chest. I felt like I was caught inside a thundering whirlwind, like I was having trouble breathing. Images of a brutal jungle war began swirling in my head. The organist finished and started putting away his music. I had met him at some of the previous funerals. He saw me standing in the back of the church, Wow, beautiful, I managed, trying to catch my breath. He thanked me, then asked with a sad smile, So, are you playing again, John? Yeah, tomorrow. Daniel Adams. I think he was in the choir when he was a kid. A little before my time, said the organist. I read about him in the paper. Someone told me he had a voice like an angel. They found him two weeks ago, I heard myself say, under the Grove Street Bridge. I'll be there, he said a look of concern on his face as he glanced up at me. Take care of yourself, John. After he left, I opened my trumpet case. The trumpet lay cushioned in dark blue velvet, the flawless brash finish reflecting the red, yellow, and orange light streaming through the stained glass. I had never been a believer, but had long ago discovered an emotional and spiritual connection to my music. On some of the darkest days of my life, music had provided comfort and even joy. 
These feelings, I had long imagined, must be close to religious experience. Even before I touched the trumpet, I could feel my mind beginning to quiet, the stress beginning to ebb, my heart rate slowing. As always, I picked it up carefully with a white handkerchief to avoid damaging the finish. I walked to the front of the church. Years ago, when I was learning to play, an instructor had told me to visualize each note as a pearl with smooth, rounded edges, circular pearls for short notes, oval pearls for longer notes. I had worked hard to follow his advice, but somehow it had always seemed too clinical, too limiting. Back then, the sound of my horn in practice rooms had seemed pale, almost muted. I had always thought my trumpet was capable of so much more. As I got older and started playing in auditoriums and concert halls, I noticed the tone became richer and deeper. But there was something special about the tone in that old church, a resonance and an undertone that seemed to rise as much from the old timbers as from the horn itself. Or, as I sometimes imagined, from the ghostly echoes of two centuries of prayer. As usual, I warmed up playing notes in the lower and middle range, Then, from memory, I started playing a favorite solo from Summertime. I closed my eyes as the storm raged outside. A new vision started to form. I saw warm, smooth, flowing gold. It was a magical place, a place I did not want to leave. Finally, I began playing more in the upper register and eventually got to my favorite, Vivaldi Trumpet Concerto. This time, when I closed my eyes, brilliant flashes of silver replaced the gold. I played through the entire piece two or three times, mesmerized by the explosions of light. Again, I could not bring myself to break the spell. My cell phone buzzed, and I looked down to see a text message from Anna. Hi, John. I just wanted you to know that Daniel would never have questioned your choice, only his own. I'll see you tomorrow. I watch as the casket is lowered slowly into the ground. I picture a smiling high school boy in a black tuxedo on prom night a boy who wanted to please his father, not a mentally ill homeless man. I tell myself that the February 6th coincidence has nothing to do with whether I made the right choice. I tell myself that what happened to Daniel that day was not my fault. Anna is standing by herself near the head of the grave. She looks lonely and frail in the gusting wind. She pauses for a moment and then bends forward, gently placing the book and the purple heart on top of the coffin just before it disappears below ground. The pastor signals to me. I lift the trumpet from my side and press the cold mouthpiece tight to my lips. This time, there is no warm building enveloping the sound. No flowing gold or flashes of silver, just pearls, pale as the morning sky, descending the hillside to the small group by the grave before returning to the sea. I close my eyes as I hold the long final note. The end. Discussion questions. One, John, the narrator, felt he had two choices, to flee to Canada or to deny the draft and join the protest. Were those his only choices? If you were in his position, what would you have done and why? Two, if John feels the Vietnam War was an unjust war, why do you think he feels so bad about fleeing to Canada? Why does he feel the need to do penance by playing military funerals? 3. In Crito, the question is asked, Do you imagine that a nation can continue to exist if the legal judgments which are pronounced in it have no force and are nullified and destroyed by private persons? What does this statement mean, and do you agree with the idea it is putting forward? 4. Are those who serve in the military and fight in wars they personally feel are unjust heroes or cowards? Which is the bravest choice? to flee the country, to protest the laws and be arrested, or to serve in a conflict you believe is wrong. Five, does loving and serving your country include supporting it, even when you disagree with what it is doing? How do you know which of those things to do anyway, and which you have a duty to disobey? What would be an example of a silly law you obey anyway? What do you think? Let's continue the discussion on our companion podcast, After Dinner Conversation Discussions, and in the comments section on our website or on Facebook. Links are in the description. 
Thank you for joining us, and we hope to hear from you soon.